Good afternoon to you all. My name is Linwood Sloan. Uh, you will hear some of our guests this afternoon refer to me as Lenny and some as Linwood. Uh, Linwood is the guy that puts the blue suit on and goes on your behalf into the dungeons of government to kind of gun run money for the arts, but Lenny is really the artist spirit inside. I am the executive director of the Commonwealth Monument Project. We identify, help to restore and conserve monuments and uh, launch new monument projects and new mural projects. And we are the co-conveners with the Dolphin County Library System of the Live and Learn Chautauqua series. Chautauqua is a tabletop teaching concept that is over 150 years. It's based upon the philosophy of each one teach one. And so each month we gather community leaders, artivists, activists, uh, and instigators for art and culture uh, together to share their projects and their knowledge, to compare their notes and their best practices, and to encourage and enlighten each other. If your child writes on the wall, forgive him or her and get them a pad of sketch paper. If they continue to write on the wall, you might want to put up some drawing paper on the wall or some poster board and give them a few more colors and a few more mediums. And if you find yourself wanting to frame their art, then you should really listen to our guests today because they will tell you how to guide your child into the process of being a community partner in the art and the activist movement of murals on the public landscape where the walls speak. We have been drawing on the walls since 2000 years before Christ. And some of the oldest artifacts that we find are examples of those drawings. And we have been drawing on the walls as late as two hours ago, where artists who are speaking with us and working with us paused in the heat for some hydration before they, they got started again. We're gonna cruise across the state today. We'll start in the capital of uh, Pennsylvania and welcome to our guests who are both in state and out of state. We also have followers from Ireland and from communities across the United States. We welcome you and thank you for continuing in this eighth session of Live and Learn. Last month's session ended with a beautiful mural in uh, Belfast, Ireland, which was done for George Floyd for Black Lives Matter. And we observed as they were preparing to paint John Lewis's image into that mural. Today, we start at the Pennsylvania Capitol with our colleagues and our friends from the Sprocket Mural Project. And welcome, Sprocket. And uh, Lisa, may I? introduce you to our guests and ask you and um, my friend and colleague and artist, uh, Ruby Daub, uh, to share with us uh, a spotlight on Sprocket, a discussion of your uh, upcoming projects and your mural festival. And we'll end with a discussion about the temporary or permanent nature of murals and ask Ruby to respond. Sure. Thank you so much, Lenny. Nice to meet everybody. My name is Lissa Richards. I am vice president of Sprocket Mural Works in Harrisburg. Um, with me, I have Ruby Dow. Ruby, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, you're muted. Hello everyone, I'm Ruby. I actually work for our Dolphin County Commissioner's Office. So I'm, I'm a, a resident of Dolphin County. But Ruby, like, like me putting on the suit, 
she puts on her beautiful dress every day and works for Dolphin County, but she's an exceptional artist in her own right and Thanks. an exquisite painter who has worked on murals and she'll talk about it. Thank you. Absolutely. So I am going to share my screen. I have a little deck so we can look at pretty pictures as we talk. Um, to me, like 99% of the reason I love talking about Sprocket is looking at the pretty pictures. <laughs> so, um, so to get started, um, Sprocket, a little bit about us, I'll introduce this. We are a grassroots mural project out of Harrisburg. Um, in 2014, you're looking at the first mural that our co-founders work on. It was a project produced by a group here in Harrisburg called Barack, but they um, brought in our co-founder, Megan Caruso, and another artist that we work with often to produce this mural. And that first work of art really sparked the fire for our organization, um, which was greatly influenced by Mural Arts Program in Philly. So it's so wonderful to be on this talk with them today as well. Um, so our first official project at Sprocket was at a place called Recycle Bicycle, a local community group who works with our neighbors and residents in the community as a place where you can bring in a bike and they'll work with you to get it fixed. They'll give you a bike if you agree to put in some time to help them. And so we worked on this project at their first location. Um, the artist that we used for this was actually a Harrisburg street artist known as SR81. Previous to this, his work was all organic, would pop up in the middle of the night on a, um, you know, a mailbox or a boarded up window. Um, he works with stencils and does lovely work. So we were really excited that for our first project, we also got to give him his first, you know, life-size canvas and it went beautifully. Uh, since then, they've relocated to a bigger, better building. And we, of course, had the same artists do some new murals on the new building. So since that time, we've just been working and increasing. Initially, we did a lot of just individual projects, one at a time. We would raise funds independently. We would seek sponsors. We would apply for grants as well as we could. And it was in, um, I think, 2016, we did a series of projects very close together. I think we did about four or five projects in the space of two months. And it really sparked the question for our founders, could we pull off a mural festival? What would that look like for us? So we. Our co-founder Meg, she pulled together some of our rock star volunteers and we decided to jump in. So we set a goal for ourselves of coming up with 10 murals in 10 days. Um, at the time, I can remember being kind of terrified to have that out there. Um, that was nothing like a scale, a scale of nothing we've ever done before. And I was so worried, like, what if we only do nine? What if we do eight? Um, but we, we jumped in, uh, we're a, we're a volunteer run organization. We're still fairly small. Um, but for us, there was a lot of benefit in doing a lot of projects all at once. We could consolidate our purchasing of supplies. We could consolidate the renting of lifts. Um, it really helped us with sponsors because we were able to generate a lot of PR all at once. And therefore that's sponsor interest was really um, was really there and we could really deliver on it. And then also we could get a lot of community interest all at once. So there was all these events that either we planned or in this case, those friends at Recycle Bicycle put together a bicycle. It was a, um, I forget the actual name, but it was a get dressed up and do a bicycle tour of our murals and you can see how many people turned out. So there was a lot of benefit for us. We could organize our volunteers together. Um, and so, you know, we just kind of were inspired by a number of other mural festivals out there and just decided to do it and learned as much as we could as we went. And in the end, I had said I was, I was concerned about that 10 murals in 10 days. But in the end, we actually produced 18 murals in 10 days, um, some of a pretty grand scale that we hadn't achieved before that. So it involved hundreds of volunteers. This is that same artist that we saw before who had done the bicycle project. We gave him another mural. We had hundreds of neighbors coming out, our community involved, local media attention. 
people were creating their own works of art at some of our events that went up on boarded homes around our city. Um, and we just had tons of people just turn out to see the murals and attend the other events. Um, it was a ton of work for our group of volunteers, but I would say it went really well and it was really well received. And we decided that this model worked for us. Um, what we did though decide was as a small group of volunteers, pulling something like this off every year was, was just not gonna be possible. We needed some time to recharge. So our next festival started in 2019. Um, we took a year off, came back in 2019 um, and had another successful festival. We decided every two years works for us. Um, we were incredibly happy with the support and interest of our second festival. Um, I think we had, for the festival in 2019, we had about 370 artists apply in our call for artists, um, including international, national, regional talent. And I think the first year we had less than 100, or the first festival, we had less than 100 artists apply. So for us, that was really dramatic and we really felt like we got to pick from some amazing talent. Um, we again surpassed our 10 mural goal and in 2019, we installed 14 new murals around the city of Harrisburg. Um, in terms of placement for us, we've, Sprocket first was concentrating on what we, we call and think of as a mural trail that's in our downtown and our midtown neighborhood. And that's the idea that we're creating this concentrated area of walkable murals because we wanted to start there so that we could generate that interest, get eyes on our projects. But with 2019, we were able to then branch out into some of our other communities and neighborhoods around Harrisburg. Um, so it was really a great experience for us. We've still got that concentrated mural trail and now we're starting to spread out and bring our, our murals to the rest of the city. Um, this year, it's two years later, so 2019. Um, as you can expect this year, a festival looks a little different for us. Um, we started our planning um, over a year ago and it was as we were all in lockdown and we didn't know what was gonna happen and um, decided to plan not just a, not, not to do this 10 day concentrated um, idea of the festival with events and lots of people turning out and all of our artists hanging out together. That just didn't seem smart um, at the time. And in retrospect, given where we are now with the current surge, um, we're really glad that we decided to change it up. So this year we're doing, instead of a festival in 10 days, we're doing a festival season. So um, we're ramping it up now. We had two murals kick off within the last week. Um, we've got another one kicking off another week after that, another two weeks after that. So we're really spacing this out through the summer and into the fall. Um, and we're not planning some of those big uh, events that we've had. Between 19 and now, we um, also became a nonprofit, which we're excited about. We've continued with other individual projects around the city. Um, and including, we've actually branched out and supported two mini mural festivals in York, Pennsylvania. And there's a third York um, mural festival happening later this month that we're supporting. So to talk a little bit about one of the projects that we've done that'll lead into our new project, um, during our first mural festival, one of the works that we produced was particularly important to our community for a number of reasons. Um, this artist, Cesar Riveros, who is actually one of the Philly mural arts artists, um, came and worked with us and he created a mural celebrating an historic landmark in our in our town with cultural significance to our community, to our city, particularly to our black community. The mural was on the north facing wall here of what, what we know as the historic Jackson House. It was a rooming house that was owned and operated by a independent black business owner. And during the jazz age, when talent like Cab Calloway and Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, would come to perform in Harrisburg, they were denied access to the major hotels. And so they would stay at the Jackson House at this building. 
So what our artists did was incorporated those figures as well as some other notable black Americans from Harrisburg, from the area. We had uh, Harriet McClintock Marshall. She was the uh, wife of a runaway slave and led the Underground Railroad here in Harrisburg. So she's on our mural. And also Ephraim Slaughter, a famous Civil War vet who um, was from the area. So they were incorporated into this piece. So it was special, not just because of the subject matter and the location, but also the creation process. Um, Cesar used a um, community incorporating approach with this, if you can see in this photo, kind of a paint by numbers technique on squares of parachute cloth. So he was able to involve children and neighbors, even people just passing by could walk up, pick up a brush and contribute to the mural. So everyone helped paint these individual squares, which Cesar then installed on the wall um, and it went up. And I'm gonna have Ruby talk a little bit about the experience she had as part of this. But the one thing to note about this project is unfortunately we lost the mural. Um, the house, uh, the Jackson House building was purchased, was undergoing renovations and the wall collapsed uh, during that process. So we did lose this really important um, you know, monument in our community. So before I move on, Ruby, do you want to take some time and talk? Ruby was involved in the creation of that. Uh, Thank Ruby. You. Yes. Ruby, may I ask you to first talk about your own work as an artist <laughs> uh, and your uh, uh, approach to uh, your, your subject, your technique, and your prolific uh, creation of work. Thank you, Linwood. And I, I really have to be completely honest that Linwood is giving me, me a great introduction. Um, <laughs> I just started painting during the pandemic, just so you know. Uh, but artwork, actually art is a part of my family. My father, I grew up in the Midtown area that Melissa, I mean, that Lissa is referring to. I'm a fourth generation Harrisburg resident. So this mural um, is extremely in the Midtown area important to me uh, and our family. My father had a two businesses on Third Street in Midtown and one of them was an art store and one that he painted and he uh, made um, artwork that was outside the box. Uh, so when this uh, and being a former member, uh, board member of the Civil War Museum uh, and seeing Ephraim Slaughter, um, the oldest African-American uh, that lived here that died, last to die here on the wall on 6th Street, which is a very highly traveled uh, road. The ADT count is pretty high, so it sits right in front of the state uh, employees. Um, the, there are schools around, the Broad Street Market around. So it's very visible to uh, every part of our community. So- And if I could interrupt you for just a moment, yes. Ruby, uh, to put a footnote into 6th Street. 6th Street was called the Black Wall Street of Harrisburg. Yes. It was very much like Tulsa's uh, uh, Black Wall Street. It was completely, destroyed through uh, eminent domain to change the boulevard to a major corridor to connect the off-ramp of the I-83 to the I-81 and to create a bypass. And so businesses, homes, churches were all destroyed and the block where the Jackson House was is the only original block left right. of that of the historic neighborhood. Absolutely true. And um, as Linwood said, as an artist, I guess I can call myself now, um, I started painting with acrylics, uh, large acrylic paintings, uh, thanks to my daughter, uh, during the pandemic and was invited to many shows. I went live on Facebook. I did it more pretty much because I didn't have much to do during the pandemic. And people loved my painting, so I was invited to shows and an enormous, pretty much all of my paintings sold. I was very shocked, um, but I did it more for 
my wellness uh, and just for peace of mind. And I, I enjoyed it. So that's that's where yeah. my thank you. For and I have a spot that. right here for one of Ruby's <laughs> paintings. I keep trying to convince her to fill it. But Ruby, you worked on that mural. How was it to work yeah, on that so mural? What? Not only the actual mural, but the community experience. Of right. Um, so that block is very important. My son, 42 year old son, got his first haircut on that block, um, two doors down. And it is a very historic block. Um, and Sprocket, I've been following Sprocket from the onset when they had their celebration on the museum um, back lawn and all the works that have gone, gone up. I love art. So I've been following everything they've done. So I've been very impressed from the very beginning. But when this, when they announced that this, I saw the sketchings of this going up, I was very excited. They also reached out to the community to see if the community wanted to get involved. I didn't consider myself an artist, so I didn't sign up to help out, right? I happened to be driving by one day and the artists and a, an enormous, enormous amount of community were in the parking lot painting. So I just said, you know, I'm going to pull over. And the artist, uh, Lisa, uh, his name is Cesar, said, join in. So I helped paint, um, I think it was part of Ephraim and the gentleman in the right hand uh, corner uh, with teachers, with students, with just community from the West Shore to East Shore. And it was a great experience. Um, not only was it a great experience at that moment, but it carried over every time you drive past there, every time you saw it in a magazine or in a newspaper, you could say, wow, I, you know, I helped I help put that up. I helped paint that, you know? And so Ruby, was, yeah. Can I ask you, yes. on the morning that you woke up and turned your TV on, and heard on the evening news, the morning news, that the, the mural and the wall had fallen down. Yeah. How did you feel as an artivist? And for those of us who joined, we on this series conjunct the word artist and activist together uh, right. to create the, uh, the term artivist, a term that was used in the WPA period in the Harlem Renaissance. And as an activist, artivist, and a community person, how did you feel about the disappearance of the mural? I was crushed. I, I can't think of any other word other than crushed because that is just not a black mural with black icons. That's an American mural. Black history is American history. So when that mural went down, a part of American history went down. So that was huge. I was crushed and actually I still am crushed, yeah. It brings you to being on the uh, panel for the uh, selection and the creation of an, a new African-American uh, monument. And Lisa, would you talk about that, that mural? Absolutely. And I'm going to jump back into sharing my screen again. And while I'm doing that, um, which, are we there? Are we seeing the Jackson yes. House again? Yes. Okay, great. I did see a question in the chat. Someone asked whether we would recreate it. Um, and right now the answer to that is no. Sprocket has a, a view on, on our murals that, that by their nature, public art is ephemeral. We can't always keep everything we want. And I don't know that we could recreate the feeling that Ruby described and that the way the community was involved. And it seems to us that just doing that same set of things with the same piece over again, wasn't really what we wanted to do. So we wanted to see how we could move forward. Um, so as we started planning our 2021 mural festival, actually, if you call, I recall, I said that was a little bit over a year ago. So we were planning that festival and it was at the same time that we were all in lockdown, all of us stuck at home, trying to process what was happening in the world in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many other black Americans. And we were to be, well, I guess a little context, Sprocket I said is a small group of volunteers. Our board is four of us and we're all white people and we, 
we're, we're wondering and asking ourselves, is there a place for Sprocket in this conversation that's happening right now? Um, you know, should we be engaging? Should we be contributing now? Should we be standing back? Um, and as we watch what happened in our community, actually another group stepped up and installed a Black Lives Matter mural. Um, it was a project led by a former US Army medic, um, combat medic. It was planned and installed by a motivated group in the community. Um, it was a wonderful project, got a lot of support, got a lot of attention. Um, it, it's a group dedicated to maintaining it, unfortunately. The mural has been vandalized more than once, but they are taking care of it and every time it gets fixed. So this project, that, again, was not Sprocket, felt right for that time. And it felt really good to, to support it um, and watch what happened. So that wasn't the right Sprocket project, Sprocket project, sorry. But as we began planning 2021 festival, we knew we wanted to make space in our program to celebrate Harrisburg's Black community. Um, and then over the winter, we lost the um, Jackson House mural, which just made us even more convinced. Um, but we also knew that our, our little group of four white organizers weren't the right people to direct a mural for our Black community. So we enlisted, um, and Lenny hasn't disclosed, he's a part of our project as well, Lenny and Ruby, and a steering committee of Black leaders and activists and community organizers in our um, in our city to be the ones to drive and make the, you know, make the decisions about this project. Um, this committee is making all the important decisions. They've, they discussed and debated and gave guidance on location, the artist, the theme that we're going with. They're helping advise us on how to engage the community in the project so that we can increase the dialogue that's happening. Um, there's many different lenses, I think, to look at a, a mural about black culture and community. For this project, we wanted to align that idea and that thinking with Sprocket's goal, which is about uplifting our community. Um, we like to create joyful, positive um, pieces of art in our community that, that bring people moments of joy when they see them. Um, so we're at a tricky place on the project. We have our steering committee. A number of decisions have been made, but not quite inked on paper yet. So there's, there's not um, a lot I can share, but I can actually share something that even Ruby and Lenny don't know. We, we got our signed contract for our wall today. So um, we do actually have our location now and I can talk about that, which is great. So this is our mural map. All of those little green circles are murals around our downtown and midtown area. And that star you see right in the center is where the new mural is going to go. It is smack in the middle of our mural trail. It is in a three block span that has the most of our murals in one concentrated area. It's a location I am really excited about. The, the group had talked about some different locations, you know, sh the, um, there's different areas of our community, but really wanted to have a location that would have the eyes on it that we felt this mural deserves. And this corner is absolutely, so this is the wall, sorry, the pictures aren't great. It's right on that third street corridor. It's a great wall looking over a parking lot. It gets a lot of traffic. It's a great surface for an artist. It's recently been rehabbed. The windows are small. There's not a lot of um, other fixtures on the wall. And it's actually that parking lot, you can see this white car, that's the same parking lot. We have these two other murals right there. It's just to us such a great um, location here for us. So um, we do have an artist picked out, but the contract isn't signed so I can't share and I don't have concept sketches yet. But um, I wanted to open, if, if Ruby and Lenny wanna talk a little bit about what that process has been like, um, and, and how some of the decisions were made. Um, I, I'd love for you guys to, to wrap us up about this project. I'd, I'd like to ask you and, and Ruby a few questions as we wrap up. Uh, listen, we strive for open, honest teaching and best practices in this series. And so I wanted to ask you and, and congratulate you for setting up the the panel and the advisory group. Uh, in this age where uh, 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 
diversity and, and equity and inclusion officers are some of the best paid people in the Western world right now. In this age where organizations are struggling to strive about cultural competency, cultural literacy, uh, speak a little more about your uh, organization and your collective coming to the realization as four young dynamic uh, white citizens uh, that you needed to reach deeper for inclusion, diversity, and equity. Talk sure. about that process. Yeah, so Sprocket through our projects and, and particularly in the festivals has always made having a wide variety of artists and wide variety of subject matters part of our process. That just is how we work. Um, I, I, I should have the numbers on this, I haven't checked, but I think at one point, a good 50% of our murals were produced by people of color. We, one of the murals I showed was done at GLOW, our, our, um, a center locally for in our LGBTQ, to LGBTQ plus community. So that's that's just how we work, making sure that when we're picking artists, we're keeping that in mind and sharing our opportunities. And when our artists are presenting concepts, we want to see diversity in those we don't guide in any certain way. Um, we have a number of projects um, already. I, I showed one of the um, murals we did the last time with faces from the community. They're actually kids from our community and making sure that we're representing diversity there has always just been the way we work. But for this project, you know, we're, myself personally, Sprocket as an organization, we're always going to have more to learn and grow about how to do this better. But we just, we just knew that this project wasn't one that we wanted to direct ourselves. Uh, we wanted to provide the means and the support, the funding, the tools, the products, but um, it, we wanted to give the space, but not control that space ourselves. And we wanted some folks from the area. So we talked to you, we, we specifically wanted, uh, our steering committee is kind of on the small side, but it's, it works because otherwise, as we all know, decision making with large groups is difficult. But in our group of six, we have artists, we have activists, we have um, a range of ages. We've got a business owner. We've got um, Lenny, who's just a man of everything. Um, so, so that was important to us too, even in making sure that with this group of Black Harrisburg citizens, we were having a diverse group to you know, contribute to and engage the discussion. So I'm not, I'm not sure what else I can say there, Lenny, other than it just no. didn't feel right for us to direct this space. We wanted to give the space to the black community in Harrisburg. I think that's very really important. And Ruby, my question for you before we, we move on to our next guest is history is like a kaleidoscope. Uh, every time you turn it, you see a different picture. This site that, you've, that, that the project has picked uh, is simultaneously uh, across the street from where some members of the community that you live in remember that the police athletic club was across the street from that site. Uh, Cal building. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that raised young black men uh, and taught them solidarity, fellowship and leadership on okay. the basketball court. Mm -hmm. It's in a building that was once the Jewish community center and the first know. Jewish so everybody claims that corner as theirs. How do you see the location enriching the, the dialogue of, uh, of Black history as American history? Yeah, yeah. It, um, uh, Lisa did not mention uh, that it's actually two blocks or maybe three from the original African-American monument. So it's still in the same neighborhood, which is major. Um, and Lim Limwood, you're right. Um, the uh, PAL building, which is originally the first Jewish community center uh, is on the same block. I mean, now it's HMAC. Uh, what basically it's in an area that is all inclusive. And that is so major in that, that area because um, that's what we want. That's what America looks like, right? So that's what our community looks like. I grew up riding my bike and, and everything in that neighborhood that was, that was all inclusive. Now, 
with that neural going down, that was major. So now it's it's a rebirth for us, right? Our presence now will go back to existing um, in that neighborhood. And it's now, because if it doesn't, um, generations to come will not understand what happened, the Jackson house, the, the, what the neighborhood looked like before. So it's very important that our presence, which is American history, stays present in Midtown. So um, our committee, which was a great committee, and thank you for, for uh, leading that, Alyssa. Uh, we had, as she mentioned, we had millennials and we have my age, Linwood's age, uh, on the committee and we've Thank had some you for not mentioning my age. Yeah, <laughs> mine, mine either. We have some differences, um, but it, it, I, we all came together, didn't we? We all came together. One thing that uh, Lissa did not mention, well, she mentioned that one of the criteria was that we did pick an African-American uh, artist that was from Harrisburg and uh, wanted to work with the community because the database that Sprocket had, which was very thorough, I was very impressed with your database, um, had many artists that refused or did not want to work with the community. So those artists that did not want to work with the community, we didn't consider. Um, so it, I, I think we did the best thing. We, we got the right person and we all agreed. Um, so, so yeah, the committee worked well. We're going to applaud you for your work. Uh, I also, having been in the conversations, know that the process and the dialogue of the committee and the organization was a piece of art in itself. And uh, I know that the art will be infused by that. We'll be uh, watching the uh, capital. Harrisburg is both the city, the county, and the capital. So as we uh, navigate Harrisburg's main corridor, Third Street, we'll be looking for that mural. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Linwood. Very much. Thank you, Lenny. Appreciate very being much. involved in this discussion. Can't uh, wait to hear from uh, everyone else. Thank you, Lisa. Hope, hope you can stay uh, with us. I, I have uh, two new friends in Lancaster. Um, both, I think, lock their doors when they see me coming uh, because they know I've got something to ask for and uh, hopefully something to give. Uh, they, they work uh, for the same cause of enrichment of the community in different aspects. Uh, Erica Joran is the executive director of the Pennsylvania Craftsman Guild, and Jake Thornton works with, I still refer to as SOWI, the, uh, the Southwestern uh, Neighborhood Organization, but he lives and works and thrives and advocates for the block that he is shaping. Uh, as homesteading and housing for America. So I welcome the two of you to talk about your project and the uniqueness of the craft and art forms that you, you bring. Erica and Jake, thanks for joining us. Thank you for that introduction. And I just wanna uh, maybe defer to Jake because you do need to do a hard stop at five because you have an, a, an important community event. So I wanna invite you if you feel comfortable to kind of go first. Sure. We have the benefit of your presentation. All right. Um, so I'm Jake Thorson. As Lenny mentioned, uh, my title is SOWE Director. Um, I work for a housing nonprofit called Tenfold in Lancaster. Um, so Tenfold in general focuses on housing education, advocacy. Um, we also do lending. We're a certified community financial development institution as well. Um, so we do a lot of micro lending um, to support affordable housing. Um, my role specifically is I do neighborhood revitalization in the Southwest uh, community of Lancaster City, uh, which is uh, historically known as the Cabbage Hill neighborhood, um, historically a German immigrant neighborhood that has seen a lot of changes. It's primarily a Latinx community um, these days with a large uh, Puerto Rican community. Um, can we kick it off with that video that I, I had, um, Ashley, if that works? Um, that was just a good introduction to kind of uh, the landscape of our community and, and what we do. And after that, I'll kind of circle um, back with some, some context as well. Mm -hmm. 
It's important to have uh, strong relationships with your neighbors because it builds a sense of community, sense of pride in your neighborhood. So we in five words would be like family, positive collaboration, we're change makers. The neighborhood that I live in, Cabbage Hill, means vibrancy, it means connections, it means life. To me it's a powerhouse. It's a powerhouse. What we where we were and what we've become is just unbelievable. Those some voices of residents that we work closely with and that are on our uh, steering committee board of directors that oversee um, our work in the neighborhood. Um, so we have a very organized, um, active 25 person board of directors made up of residents of the neighborhood, um, but also some stakeholders of nonprofit leaders, as well as business owners. Um, they meet monthly, they guide our our work in the neighborhood. Uh, I'm just, after this loads, I'll, I'll kind of go into some more. All right, if you want to click through it. So um, we aim to send, send the tide of disinvestment and create a neighborhood that is safe, clean, attractive to economic investment, welcoming to residents and visitors. Um, so again, we're primarily a disenfranchised, lower income neighborhood um, in Lancaster City. Um, so at the start of this, we're really trying to intervene in the housing market, create home ownership opportunities. Um, and that really turned into a large scale community development um, initiative that focuses well beyond just housing um, to park safety, education, public art being a big component of it. Um, the mural that you're seeing here was done by an artist named Selena Almanzar, who's a local muralist in Lancaster City. Um, this was done as we were working with the city of Lancaster to renovate uh, Culleton Park. Um, so she spent almost two summers down at the park engaging with neighbors to, to understand the design um, considerations for the park. Um, as well as um, just creating a vision and space in, in um, a blighted public area. So she turned a lot of the people that she was engaging with um, into this mural project. And this wall is on the back of Water Street Rescue Mission um, that overlooks the park. And they all kind of have halos around them. So they're kind of the saints of, um, of the neighborhood overwatchers of the park here. Just click through, please. Thanks. So this is area, if you're not from Lancaster, this, this is kind of micro to <laughs> Lancaster City. Um, but we're, you know, we're um, basically the southwest quadrant of Lancaster City. Um, very dense residential neighborhood, very diverse in terms of income, age, um, and race. Next slide, please. Um, I explained a little bit of how we got here, again, focusing on housing development. Uh, we received a um, planning grant and an implement implementation grant from the Wells Fargo Regional Foundation, um, where we really went out and engaged with a lot of residents, did a widespread community survey, surveying over 300 households um, to understand resource gaps, programs that need to happen, needs, um, and that resulted in over $6 million of investment into the neighborhood over the past uh, four years here. Um, so again, everything from housing initiatives to purchasing blighted condemned properties to um, supporting artists in the, in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. So I, I spoke a little bit of the goals before, but again, it's uh, comprehensive comprehensive community development. So it's, um, you know, not just housing as a housing organization, but uh, we work closely to build connections between neighbors, um, looking at parks, green spaces, the public realm, community safety as a big component, education, um, economic development or opportunity for our residents and our business corridors, um, communications and housing. Next slide, please. 
So we do um, a lot of work in partnership. Um, you know, we say, so we is an initiative. It's a partnership initiative. Um, we're not our own nonprofit, but we are um, a, a partnership organization that's made up of two leadership bodies, one being this uh, Southwest Neighborhood Collaborative that is um, all the nonprofit organizations that really have a stake or are located in into the neighborhood. Um, we use kind of a collective impact model where um, you know we all realize that we're not good at everything. So let's make sure we're putting partners in the right place um, to kind of achieve our, our overall goals that we agree on. Um, so these are some of the local partnerships that we um, have a formalized memorandum of understanding with um, that each have a key component of the SOE revitalization strategy. Next slide, please. And the other leadership piece of um, the organization or the initiative is that resident board of directors that I spoke of previously. So it's these two, two groups, one kind of the nonprofit implementers and then the, the neighbors who are um, kind of the, the guiding body. You know, the, we, they, they put together the budget each year. Um, they're deciding where, where funding's going, who's doing what. Um, so these are some just good pictures of the neighborhood. Uh, we have bike racks out in the neighborhood. Um, we do a, a lighting project, so we'll install lighting on, on your house um, to brighten up the streets. So this is uh, West Strawberry Street in, in Lancaster, where most of the house, homes have um, lighting on there. But trash cans out in the streets. So these are just some kind of small public facing um, projects that you see. Um, as you go through the Southwest neighborhood now. Next slide, please. Some key accomplishments um, that we work it through. Um, again, a lot of housing related goals of uh, renovating properties, uh, creating affordable rentals, um, working with artists, um, muralists. Uh, so there's a local pa painting company in the neighborhood um, that we partnered with to do a mural project. Um, we called it a mini mural project. So we paired local artists with homeowners and a lot of murals were created on stoops, um, some on walls, but they're all probably no bigger than four by four. Um, that's probably the biggest one. Um, so there is kind of a big a little um, mural trail in the neighborhood. And then um, two dudes painting also put, a, put up a large mural on there building, um, which is, you can see from, from the street there. And it, it's, uh, it's definitely a draw for a lot of the community. Um, and then just creating events, series of events for neighbors to engage with each other um, and, and supporting neighbors as well. Next slide, please. So we're, as we're doing this work, you know, we're always looking at what's next. How do we engage more? Um, so some of the, the additions of the neighborhood are, are um, you know, continuing housing development. Housing is probably the biggest uh, hurdle for our community right now, and I'm sure in a lot of your communities as well. Um, we're looking at green space and then art. So two um, cool art projects that we have coming is one, we're working with the city of Lancaster to do an artful intersection on a major intersection in the neighborhood, um, using art as a tool to um, create a safer space for, uh, for pedestrians and bicyclists. So using art to shorten or, or shrink the width of, of streets. Um, so we're working with a local artist to do that. Um, we've got through a period of a lot of engagement with the community figuring out you know, um, what, what people wanna see, but also how we can do this that uh, aligns closely with the community. And then also we're just starting out in this new venture with uh, Erica and her team at the Pennsylvania Guild of Craftsmen. Um, I'll let her kind of talk about the details, but um, we're looking and going through this process to really be the host site and, and help um, the guild identify a location in the neighborhood, but also work with the community um, as we are very much connected to the residents, but also to partner organizations, youth, youth agencies. Um, so we're, we're kind of bridging this gap between um, the guild and the neighborhood, which we're really excited about. Um, 
really excited about the process um, and really excited about whatever the final outcome may be. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Erica. Erica, may I ask Jake one quick question because I know he has to, to go on. So yeah, sure. Jake, one quick question that is two parts. You are doing as much art education as you are doing art installation. And uh, how do you form an understanding of the, the selection process? As you put together community panels uh, to select artists and to uh, develop projects, how do you bring the community along? Uh, we all talk about community, community uh, involvement, community uh, ownership, uh, uh, stakeholders, but what is the process of you bringing people with varied understandings of what is art? Yeah, it's very from project to project, I'd say. Um, you know, some have been very grassroots. I talked about uh, Selene Amanzar's project of just literally setting up an arts and crafts table at the park for two summers and allowing people to come to her and talking to community members. Um, there's other projects where steering committees were formed um, and use those individuals as, as a kind of, um, you know, a, a group to kind of throw ideas against and help guide as an advisory committee. Um, so it looks different in different forms. I think it depends on the scope of the project, um, but I would say it's pretty key, you know, art, at times, it was, me and Erica were talking about this, especially public art, it's, it's kind of a, um, it's a hot topic at times and residents have mixed feelings about it. Um, a lot of times it's a signal of change in the neighborhood, right? It's um, a signal of gentrification, rising property values, displacement, culture change, whatever it may be. So there is this huge, you know, we're very careful about going through and inviting kind of artists or uh, organizations into the community, um, just because that is a real concern. Um, it's something we're experiencing on the neighborhood level of housing prices going up. And, you know, you see real estate listings, you know, trendy SOE neighborhood, um, where, you know, a few years ago, you could buy a house for, you know, 40 grand here, and now they're selling for 200,000. So it's, it's, um, it's something that, it's really important to engage the community and make sure they're aware of, of, of the project, but also have that buy-in so they feel ownership of you know, defending projects when it's done intentionally and done in, in the right way. Um, but there is kind of these external adverse effects sometimes that uh, are out of our control. That, that, that leads me to my, my, my second question and thanks for your generosity of time. So how do you, as custodian in the best sense of that word, having custody of the process <laughs> and the neighborhood, deal with negotiating or navigating what I'm going to refer to as the Straits of Magellan between pushback and feedback? You know, um, yeah, yeah. Critique it's... and criticism. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so we're, you know, we're not artists ourselves. We're definitely conveners, right? So we're conveners of community and, and um, conveners of partner artists. Um, so we a lot of times stand in the middle of it in, in uh, hopefully in a positive, productive way to kind of get to an end goal where people are both happy with an end product and supportive of an end product. So it, I don't want to call it negotiation, but it is a lot of um, back and forth trying to build coalition and build understanding of kind of the end vision and the end um, net impact of, of the mural or or whatever the public art or whatever the public project is, to be honest, art is one of the many, many, many items that um, has a lot of kind of community input and, and navigation through. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jake. Uh, and thanks for making the time for us. I know it's a busy day for you. Yeah. Uh, Erica. 
Tell us about your uh, magic. By the way, uh, Webster's Dictionary defines magic as the manipulation of ordinary things in extraordinary ways. And uh, so Eric is going to talk about making magic with uh, several different mediums. And uh, Ashley, if you want to start up that PowerPoint. I'm going to move quickly through this, everybody, because the great thing is you got to hear about the magical opportunity that's very humbling that we get to enter into with the community. So I'm Erica Duran. I'm the executive director of what we call the PGC. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I reside and also am sitting on the land of uh, the Susquehannock. Um, and I've been huge, a huge art fan of Sprocket and Philadelphia mural arts for a long time. So we feel like we're very humble today. Um, next slide, Ashley. Thank you. So how we began uh, and why we exist, how we started. Um, Americans were certainly encouraged to be self-sufficient uh, in the wake and during World War II. So certainly the whole idea of making things, even weaving from dog hair was very, very um, important. And, and uh, I love the fact that making is still a big part of our state and, and what we do. So the UN actually held a craft exhibition in Madison Square Garden in 1944. And as a result of that, 185 craftspeople came together in PA and formed the PGC. They had their first show at the Philadelphia Arts Alliance and Eleanor Roosevelt spoke at that opening. So it's very symbolic as to the support of what we were entering into. Next one. So why do we need to exist? Well, we are an educational nonprofit. We have been around since 1944. Um, we, we have a higher purpose um, to keep these fine craft disciplines alive in Pennsylvania. Of course, we have traditional uh, craft and we have these days even people continuing that, uh, the traditional disciplines, but putting a, a modern spin on it. And we also have contemporary fine craft makers. Um, one of the things that we are very uh, supportive of, though, is, is not just the higher purpose, but making sure that we are really supporting practicing and uh, teaching crafters. Because uh, it was a very hard thing for those that made their living through selling fine craft to get by in 2020 and most of 2021. During COVID, one of our members actually described us as a lifeline because we were the community, we're the, um, we're, art making is so central and certainly uh, very healing for our community. And we all saw that. Next one. So who we serve. We, we exist to serve creators at every single age, ability, economic circumstance. Um, we want beginners. We want masters. Everyone is new when they get started at it. Um, we definitely wanna make sure that we're providing these artists with income opportunities and professional development opportunities. Next one, Ashley. Thank you. So how we serve. Um, we've got some photos of some of our major programs. At the very top, we have highlighted our fine craft fairs. They not only attract thousands of people every year to Philadelphia and Wilmington and areas beyond, but they also support over 500 perhaps artists um, annually. I mean, again, this is how these folks make their living. We also have noted here our guild store. Our guild store supports over 125 artists. Uh, everything is handcrafted either made in Pennsylvania or beyond. And we have educational programs, including our workshops. Uh, we continue to do those during COVID online, 
Uh, we had smaller class sizes, lots of protocol changes, or we took our programs to the sites. And the next one, please. Keeping Ashley busy. So where we are, we are called the Pennsylvania Guild of Craftsmen. We are not just in Pennsylvania. Uh, there are no borders online, of course. We have a hub in Lancaster City. We have four studios in that hub. We have a guild store. Um, we have our office space there. Before that point, we had our office in Harrisburg. Bef after that, we were in Bucks County. So we've been in Lancaster for a little bit. Um, but we are also in senior centers, traveling to them, to schools, to events, working with other partner studios throughout our service area of really Pennsylvania and Delaware, so that folks who don't want to travel the sometimes two and three hours that they do travel to Lancaster, they can go to those spaces. We, um, our edu educating and uh, exhibiting artists actually live in over 10 counties in Pennsylvania. Uh, we also are in Delaware because Delaware does not have a state craft guild. We do a lot of our work through our 11 chapters. Those are vaguely highlighted as centers where they have their meetings on the map. Um, the beauty of really supporting our chapters is those folks understand their communities deeply. They serve their communities with depth. Um, they know who they're working with. They work with colleges. They work with art schools and recent graduates. Um, they really find ways to fold their whole community into fine craft education. Next one, Ashley. So what we aspire to, we applied for this opportunity. It was a very, very competitive process. Um, I have been, had a huge art crush on the DeVos Institute of Arts Management through the University of Maryland for a long time. They do amazing support to communities and arts organizations in terms of strategic planning, um, everything that you can think of, program building, engagement. And we applied to this opportunity, which is about learning to skillfully and sensitively build social cohesion through the arts. So we're one of 11 organizations engaged in the support. It's pro bono, which is really wonderful. We're the only organization in PA. Um, so we are convening, as you can imagine, throughout this process with other organizations throughout the country. So we're all learning together from each other. Um, we have just begun doing this planning together in August. And as we wrote this application, we connected with SOE. Um, we're incredibly humbled and honored every time we get an opportunity to speak to the residents uh, and Jake and their advisory board. I mean, we know that this is an invitational situation that we cannot insert ourselves into. We need to make sure that we are doing it uh, in a followership mode. Um, we certainly don't want to do anything that would smack of colonialism or, you know, bringing our opportunities into the neighborhood. We want to work with the artists that are already living there and working there. Um, and we really need that project to be, be the community, not just what the community wants. So um, I asked Ashley, maybe at some point she'll put the uh, URL in the chat so that you can see what the organizations are aiming to do through this training. But we're essentially looking to get a program design evaluation, uh, visibility for the program, funding. It's also going to help um, all of us with institutional wealth and building that. Um, it's going to give us, we are a smaller nonprofit that has a pretty um, wide range of service, um, both in what we offer and who we offer it to. It's going to give us the organizational uh, capacity to really serve um, what we're learning. And, you know, I, their description from the website, I won't read all of it, but what really struck me was, and I'll paraphrase so as not to draw it out, but Arts creates community, understanding, and empathy. And historically, it really succeeds when you engage individuals and groups that are already inclined into conversation with each other. So 
you've got this gathering of like minds uh, bound by several things, could be geography, background or interest, and you've got that cohesion. However, this program aims to connect through creative process in, in our thoughts, fine craft, um, ways of life that wouldn't usually collaborate or see eye to eye. Um, we want to build alliances, we want to build partnerships, and we want a sustainable relationship. We're not interested in just getting in and doing a project and patting ourselves on the back as an arts organization. We were really building a relationship. That is slow and it is hard and it is sensitive. And um, of course the easy things are not, you know, the easy things are quickly done but the hard things take a little longer. So I actually am finishing that up actually with um, sewing with that, with that screen because what I wanna to do to just put a capstone on what uh, Jake and I talked about, we are look, we've got some aims, even though we can't tell you what the project is going to be or what it's gonna look like. Um, we would like to serve Lancaster City with, um, serve with the Sewey neighborhood. We would like to use fine craft materials to create art. Uh, we would like to work with the neighborhood artists, even if they don't work in that medium currently. We would like to have this art piece, whatever it winds up looking like, to include a stamp of each person that's engaging in this work. Uh, we have a way to do it through fine craft medium in a way that honors and celebrates the seven-year-old as well as the 77-year-old. So we want someone to be able to look at this work and say, hey, I created that and have its own special stamp that adds into the whole. Um, we believe that the process and the learning here from the organizations and from the people that engage is actually more important in fact than the finished product. We don't know what the finished product is going to look like until we get rolling into it and we are comfortable with that space. Um, and the experience is going to be kind of our monument. You know, the art's going to remain and the art's going to be here, but we need the process to be clearly understood and shared for people that look at this piece. Um, one of the things that I thought up in terms of this, this theme of, you know, making monuments through art is what does it mean when you make a monument to a community, to a residential area? Um, I really think that so we understand that every community member is monumental, they're necessary and they bring their own gifts to the community. So what will that look like? Stay tuned because uh, we'll be figuring out some planning in the next few months. Let me add some uh, uh, footnotes to this, uh, which are so exciting to me. Um, so Jane, the um, Sewey neighborhood uh, arm wrestled with Coca-Cola for years. Coca-Cola owned a triangular piece of land where three streets came together in the neighborhood. And they had their Coca-Cola sign as a billboard on this piece of land, which eclipsed the light for the neighbors. It, uh, it completely blocked about a third of the block's light out and it cast its shadow on the other side of the block. So Jake and his colleagues in the neighborhood not only got Coca-Cola care the sign billboard down, but to devote the triangular piece of land as a pop-up park. So now they are developing a plan for a pop-up park. The, the triangle is anchored by a, a dynamic wall. And it was their intention to, to have a painted mural on that wall until they began conversations with Erica, who was also looking for a community to work with with her new project. And now they're, they're, they're beginning the process of creating a tactile uh, 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 wall made up of all of the mediums that are represented by the Craft Guild blend it into the experiences of the community, bringing a community that was made up of laborers, of iron workers and bricklayers 
and glazers bringing the crafts of the guild and the history of the neighborhood into the multi-dimensional wall that will anchor the, the uh, triangular top. I think it's a very exciting project. I think it's a, uh, they're reticent to talk about it, uh, the uh, process because they're just uh, uh, putting the community's commitment together. But I think the most exciting, not the most exciting, but a an exciting thing is that this was a historic blue collar labor's neighborhood of men and women who worked in factories with all the mediums that, that uh, Erica's artists represent who did not see themselves as artists or craftsmen, but can now bring to their children, their neighbors and their neighborhoods, the collaboration and the participation uh, as this piece unfolds. So it's, it's a very exciting and dynamic way to blend the community's intention, the, uh, the guild's opportunity, and the, and the, uh, the learning experience of um, re um, committing to the dignity of work and, uh, and work by hand. Uh, uh, and so I, I thank you very much, Erica. Uh, uh, we're real excited about your, your process. Also, uh, uh, please thank Jake. I know he's feeding people tonight, literally in his community, but um, he, you guys are doing, he's doing food for the Bella shelter for the residents, and you're doing food for the heart and the spirit by bringing this, this art together. So thank you very, very much. Uh, and we're glad to see you. We'll keep following you your process on our website. We have uh, two projects next uh, that are uh, the conjunction of, um, we, we all know the value of suns and moons. We all know the value of leaders that shine light on us so that we can reflect that in our communities across America. Jane Goldman is one of those sons, one of those great lights that have reflected how the landscape uh, of our communities and the landscape of our thinking can change by the uh, art animating democracy. And so we're gonna talk about two projects back to back. First, we're gonna talk ab about uh, the Mill Arts Program and this very exciting uh, piece of employment for uh, folks. Uh, and then we're going to extend that conversation as we come full circle with the Color Convention Project, talking about their new African American mural in collaboration with Mural Arts, which brings us back to the kinds of conversations that Lisa and um, uh, Ruby uh, started us with is uh, elevating African-American art and history to American art and American history. So I uh, welcome uh, colleague inspirationist uh, Jane Goldman. And I, I transitioned to Jane by saying that, again, Webster defines the word inspiration as in putting the spirit in, to inspire, to infuse the spirit in the world. So I am always inspired by Miss Jane Gold. Oh, well, thank you, Linwood. Well, you're inspiring too. So thank you for your support and your kind words. And I am so happy to see Brandy and Denise. Hi, <laughs> my esteemed colleagues who I adore and really just love working with and everyone who presented today. Oh my goodness. Like such inspiring, beautiful, humbling work. Um, so I start out with a lot of gratitude. Uh, and I want to introduce my, my wonderful colleague, Nadia Malik, who runs our Porch Light program. And Nadia and I are going to um, team up. Um, so uh, if we could, I don't know who's sharing the presentation. Okay. Go. I can, yeah. 
Okay, so just a, just a little bit of background about mural arts. There's our mission statement. And we've worked with DeVos. They did our, a few of our strategic plans. So that was exciting too. Um, so yeah, we're always, okay. So let's go just back in time. I'll go really fast because I know we don't have a lot of time. So, um, so I had the really good fortune and privilege to be hired by the good administration to work for the Anti-Graffiti Network. And my, my job was, according to my job description, was to reroute the, the negative energy of graffiti writers to something positive. And I was like, oh, okay, I don't know. I'm, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I was completely over my head. But um, it was this great time in Philly. Uh, I got to work with, you know, graffiti writers who had enormous talent. Did, did, all these young people had talent and no opportunities. And so we flew into action. And um, that picture was the amnesty pledge. So kids would come in, they'd swear with Wilson Good, I'm never going to write on walls. And then if they liked art, they were sent to me. And I had to think of what to do. So we had programs and then we started doing murals. And that was like super exciting. And then for 10 years, like we worked with like 25,000 young people and did murals. And people were like, and Wilson Good too was like so surprised, like everyone loves art. And we saw art become like a beacon and a focal point and a sign that things could change that, and people cared and that government could be effective. So murals actually became catalytic, like a B12 shot. But we learned early on, when you go into communities, you better go in respectively. respectfully. You have to go in with more questions and answers. Do not make assumptions and really um, value the authorship of every community. And I think, and I posit that, the resilience of the mural movement in our city, because we've made it through five mayors, is indeed because of the broad range of authors that it has encompassed all these years. So we're part of it, but we're like a platform and a forum on which things can happen. So then, okay, fast forward. So then we become like anti-graffiti closes down. My former boss sadly passes away. I think I'm going to law school, but thankfully my brother took me out of law school. So I went to the next mayor, Ed Rendell, and asked if he would create a community-based public art program. He said, yes. He said, come up with a name. We said, oh, the mural arts program. So he said, okay, we were like shocked. And then we like had no budget, but there were five of us, me and a teaching artist, Dietrich, and a couple of the former graffiti writers. And so we were transferred to the Department of Recreation. We had like $100,000. They didn't know what to do with us. So they gave us an empty floor in this building, but you know, artists love empty floors. We had creaky furniture, but that was okay because we were like a pro art program. So then we started doing murals everywhere. <laughs> and we were like, okay, we're not stopping. Um, and then fast forward, fast forward, 2000. And two, three, four, five, there's a new mayor, John Street. We were made part of the Division of Social Services. So we started working with the Department of Public Health, Department of Behavioral Health, Department of Prisons, Department of Human Services. And boom, it was like suddenly our program just quadrupled and we were working with more artists everywhere across the city. So, oh, Nadia, could you go back for a minute? Yeah. Oh, so let me just... Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, so now, um, so quickly, just a little bit of just about projects. So, so programs. So this is a part of art education. This is Amy Sherrill who did Michelle Obama's portrait. It's eight stories tall in the middle of our city. And just, I want to just hang on to this just for a minute because of our, all the conversations. And then I would thank you for talking about bringing up the conversation about monuments. And what I love when we did Monument Lab a few years ago, I loved how people talked about murals as monuments. And I do think it's intimacy and public space. And what the work, there are over 4,000 murals in our city, but they're resonant, connected to the citizens of Philadelphia. This is not, and, and I think you've heard it with, your, with our colleagues on the call tonight. Like it's not like art that swoops in and swoops out. That happens around the world often. But so it's so wonderful that, that like a process like this, there was a community process, a community of young people, hundreds of them who studied Amy Sherrill, who went to her studio in Hoboken. And this is a portrait of one of our um, young participants who is in our program for kids aging out of foster care. And this is in the middle of our city. And what does this say? It's a beacon, a light. Okay, sorry, I got so excited. <laughs> okay. Next. And then, oh, and then we have, you know, we are always having community meetings. We have small meetings, big meetings. We're always bringing people together. And this is part of our porch light work, which Nadia will tell you about in a few minutes. And then we have hub spaces. So we think about mural arts. You think about, we have a number of departments, uh, five departments, and each area has different ways of engaging people. And in the porch light program, we have hub spaces. So we take over empty spaces and we turn them into thriving community centers. Our headquarters is in the Spring Garden section of Philadelphia. 
but we're not that connected with this section of the city. You know, we do, you know, some work here, but it's our headquarters, but we're everywhere. And it's important we be embedded in the community for longer periods of time. And there are it's a porous relationship so that where we end and begin, it's like not clear because we want the community to be completely like to feel co-ownership with the work. And these hub spaces help that to happen. And we engage, we have um, a couple different programs throughout mural arts where we are engaging community leaders. We have, um, we, we actually are compensating people. People are working with us. We're bringing together schools and communities. We have community leaders who are actually leading mural projects. So again, how do you not be top down or didactic or overly prescriptive when you're working in the community and you have to make space for everyone? And then we have paint days. We have a million paint days a year. So it's like we have one mural. It's not in this presentation. It was the one we did that was connected to the Pope's visit and 7,000 people worked on it. Like it, we painted at the convention center. We had like, you could hear like 12 languages, but everybody could universally agree on pass the brush, give me the green paint. So it was like, <laughs> it's like, how do you sort of lift up like distinctions and our differences and, and respect that and underscore a commonality. And the paint days really do that because it weaves together people who didn't know each other, whose paths never would have crossed, but they're all working on something big and bold and wonderful and inspiring. And here, this is another art education mural. I just love this because it's just a snapshot of dedications. We also have like 175 <laughs> like events every year where we're dedicating the murals. And it's like, look at this, this is so beautiful. This is um, Akira Jones and uh, well, Wale. And Wale um, is a fashion designer and an artist and a lawyer and he lives in West Philly. And he did some of the fashions um, for Black Panther. So it's like, ah. He's so he's like wonderful. And he did these like Renaissance paintings around the library, but with contemporary people from the neighborhood. So it was like this joyous day because it was like, look, it's us. And it was like so beautiful and he used gold leaf paint. <laughs> so anyway, and here by the numbers, just something, little tidbits, 250 artists. Yes, it's like the WPA. We want artists working. Yeah, we want to pay them well. We want to let them know they have real value in our society. Like that's so important. Artists are change agents. And then 25,000 people are involved every year in all our different divisions all over the city. About 75 murals a year are generated. Um, uh, artworks created with 1K room. I'm not sure what that means actually. Um, but in the creative economy, I do know we spend about 2.7 million, about 2.8, 2.7 million in the creative economy, hiring artists, teaching artists, assistant artists. Um, and that's our annual operating budget, $10 million. 35% is from the city, the rest we raise. And here are our departments, public art and civic, and civic engagement. So we do big non-traditional works, not just murals, art education. 2,000 young people are involved ages 11 through 18. And then if you get more advanced, we have an entrepreneurial program, assistantship program, internship program. Restorative justice is awesome. We're working in prisons and jails and with people coming home and um, really dignifying their experience by like they're, they're transforming our city and we're teaching all kinds of skills. It's a, it's a jobs program and we have a jobs developer on staff and we have an 8% recidivism rate. So I don't want anyone telling me that art doesn't matter. Art matters. Porchlight program, that's, a, that's Nadia who's gonna explain what Porchlight is, is our partnership with the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. Our tours program, because people we want people to get out and see the work, bicycle tours, Segway tours, walking tours and trolley tours. And the Mural Arts Institute where we're working with cities across the country to build capacity, but it's also, I have to emphasize the word mutuality. We're learning as much from our colleagues across the country as they are from us. So it's a great exchange of information. And the Porchlight program. Okay, Nadia. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I'll give a very brief overview of our Porchlight program, just to let everyone know where um, the Color Me, Book, Color Me Back program that Lenny talked about, just where that sits within our department. Um, so Porchlight, um, uh, one of the other presenters referenced the Yale School of Medicine. They did an amazing study of our program when we first started um, to talk to look at this link between mental health, behavioral health, and art making. And so we, as Jane mentioned, work with the Department of Behavior, Department of Behavior Health. Our focus is on working with those who uh, are dealing with mental health issues, who um, are dealing with trauma, um, and really using art as a, a pathway for mental health. 
Um, I, I will go through very quickly an overview of our work so that I can concentrate on calling me back. As um, Jane mentioned, we work in a lot of behavioral health sites. So we have an artist go into a behavioral health site. We partner with, two, uh, with them over two years and then work on two murals in that behavioral health site. So again, using art in conjunction with the other resources that they already have in that behavioral health site. Um, and really this um, work in our provider sites is to destigmatize mental health, to put, put it out there in a public way it, as a mural to talk about the things that people are talking about behind doors so that we can remove those mental health stigmas. Um, so these are just some of the murals that we've worked on with various provider sites. Um, and Morris Home is our current provider site. Um, they're a space that um, provides recovery, um, uh, residential recovery services specifically for trans and non-binary folks. Um, every year we also do what we call our signature projects. This is just a year long project that we work on to really focus on one issue or one area of the city um, specifically on a mental health issue. Um, this is our suicide prevention mural that unfortunately is being built in front of, but we do have money to continue this project. So again, really putting out there publicly um, a, a, the, a conversation about something that's really stigmatized, um, making it a public issue that, so that people are not afraid to talk about mental health issues. Um, I'm just going to scroll quickly so I can get to our um, project. And then as Jane mentioned, we have our hub spaces, our storefronts, so that we are embedded within communities. Um, we have three hub spaces, um, one in Southeast by Southeast, uh, one, um, called Southeast by Southeast, that's in Southeast Philadelphia, where we work with refugee and immigrant communities. And then we have a similar program in, um, in our other um, portion of Philadelphia called Northeast. And again, we work with refugee and immigrant communities. So again, this work is we're embedded in communities we're working with people in a way that hopefully is um, approachable to them, where if their community is coming into Philadelphia, we're um, trying to talk to them about their issues in a way that's recognizable to them. Um, and then Kensington, we work with a community that's affected by opiate use disorder. Um, it's a community that's really, um, you know, been uh, dealing with um, an increase of folks who are um, using opiates in the neighborhood and also an increase of folks who are um, homeless because of that use um, or because of other factors that are going on. So our goal in Kensington is to work with the community as a whole, working with those directly affected by opiate use and then the community that's affected by that as well. Um, but today we wanted to concentrate on Color Me Back, um, which is our newest program. Um, this program, as Lenny mentioned, is we work with those who are economically insecure, those who are housing insecure, and pay them on a daily basis to work with us on mural making. So um, there's a lot of same-day work programs in the, uh, in the country in general, but we're the only same-day work program that offers art making as the work that we pay people for. Um, this, mo this program is built on a lot of the other models that we have within Porchlight where we're using art as a thing to attract people um, and art as a thing that um, brings people into our space. Um, we're paying them for that work, but then our goal is to then um, uh, guide people towards um, jobs and use this program as a way to break down those barriers. Whatever barriers might be keeping folks from getting a job, we're gonna work with you on that. Um, just quick overview, we've been working since April, 2019. Um, we um, have fluctuated in the number of people that work with us every day, mostly because of the pandemic. Um, we were building up to 20 to 30 people a day working with us. We've scaled back down to 10 at the moment for safety concerns, but we're going to keep ramping that up to 20 to 30 as we um, hopefully get further out of this pandemic. Um, but we pay people um, on, a, on a weekly basis. Um, they work with us four days a week. Um, we have um, paid uh, more than 600 people. Um, who've been working with us. Um, some work with us long term, some work with us for a week at a time, um, and we've been able to give out more than $150,000 in wages to um, it, it, as part of this program. Um, we have, have a lot of amazing partners who work with us um, to make sure that this program runs well. We have the paint, painting, of course, but then also all the other people that we work with to help people get into jobs to support us um, in, um, in uh, breaking down some of these barriers. Um, so this is our studio space that we work in, um, loaned to us. We're in Suburban Station. If you're in Philadelphia, um, right near City Hall, um, we have uh, a space that was loaned to us by SEPTA. Um, and we have an art making studio there. Every day people come in, um, every day people work with us, and then every day they get paid um, out of that studio space. Um, the studio is really, really built by the artwork that comes from our participants. Um, all Everything that you see in our studio, it's all the work that um, our participants have done with us. 
Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we have a lot of different things that we're aiming for in Color Me Back. We want to have uh, folks have an avenue for referrals. Um, so when a lot of folks come to us, especially those who have been living on the street, the reason that they've been living on the street could be, um, you know, there's a million different reasons for that. Um, we're trying to really break down, okay, what are the things that we can help you with? Um, our goal, our eventual goal is to get people into jobs, but we re recognize that it takes a while to get there. Um, if uh, you don't have an ID, that's, we work with you to get an ID. Um, if you have um, issues with your benefits, right? A lot of folks are worried about working full-time because it'll affect the, the way that their benefits are set up. We work with organizations to make that happen. Um, if you are interested in mental health services, we're happy to refer you to those, but also we want to work with you on a daily basis to destigmatize that mental health concern. Um, we want to make it comfortable so that when you come to us, you recognize that whatever you bring to us, we want to work with you. Um, we really pride ourselves in having a very low barrier program. So that means that we, um, if you're ready to work, if you show up, then we will work with you. Um, if you have um, physical health concerns that keep you from painting, we'll find something else to make sure that you find a way to work. Um, the only way, uh, the only time that we'll ask you to leave is if you disrupt the program in some way. And even then we work with you to try to bring you back in and um, uh, make sure that um, we're addressing the reason why you might weren't having a good day that day. Um, and so again, on a daily basis, we want to work with folks. We start every day with a morning meeting. We try to work with folks on like, it's our pet practice that you're going to talk about your feelings um, at least once a day, right? We're going to ask you how you're feeling that day, what you're bringing into that space. And we're hoping that practice, you're with us enough that you recognize that this is um, a good practice to have in place, that there's all these things going on outside. When you're in our space, you can use that time to get away from everything else that's going on and use art as that way to work on mindfulness, use art as a way to channel any of the frustrations that are coming in, um, really using art making as, again, an avenue for employment. Um, and again, just by show, proving to us that you show up every day, we're pretty strict about our timings. You have to be there at 8 a.m. Um, and people show up every morning at 8 a.m. Um, we're working with you on time management, on responsibility. Um, you, have to, uh, you don't have to show up every day if you have other things going on, but we do expect that the days that you do are showing up that you're working with us. Um, and then on a weekly basis, if anybody, uh, we work with an organization called CareerLink, um, anyone who's in our program at any time is um, able to come in on the days that CareerLink is there to work with specifically on resume building, on fiscal responsibility and other kind of courses with us so that you can work on, you can put our work on your resume, but also build other um, skills to help you get to that job placement. Um, and then, of course, we're also working on actual art skills as well, making art making. Um, we've been able to hire a bunch of folks in our program in uh, through mural arts as well. People who've come to us who really, really enjoy the art making portion of it have learned a lot of skills. And so we're able to hire them on a contract basis to work with us on other projects. So we're um, trying to be somewhat that avenue for that employment as well, like practicing what we preach, bringing people in um, who've gone through a program who've shown that they're ready to work. Um, so just some of the projects that we worked on. Um, again, we're in Suburban Station, so we this was the first project that we worked on. P folks in our program were the ones who painted this mural fully. Um, we had a designer and an art teaching artist to teach them how to do it, but um, the folks in our program were the one um, were the ones who did this mural. The great thing about working in Suburban Station is that many of the folks who work with us live in Suburban Station. That's what they called their home. They lived in the subway station. So they're helped beautifying the space that they call home as well. Um, it means, it helps ingrain them more. They're not on the outskirts of society, right? They're fully ingrained in the work that they're doing. This is their home and we're acknowledging that um, and also helping to beautify it um, in, that, in that same way. Um, the dedication for that mural. Um, and then the biggest project that we just finished is um, in um, one of the underground stations, uh, Walnut Locust in Philadelphia. Um, it was a series of 200 columns that were pretty bleak, of just, you know, um, painted one uniform color. So we hired an artist. And again, a lot of our participants lived in this um, in this area. Um, we heard a lot of jokes when we were working that you're standing in my living room right now, right? Like this was a, an area where uh, that a lot of people called home because it's underground, um, it's protected from, from weather. So, so a lot of people knew this area. And so we wanted to um, help beautify it, right? This um, area, if you've been in Philadelphia um, previously, it wasn't the greatest area to walk through if you're walking through from one subway to stop to another. It's just kind of dark and dank and not really pretty. Um, so we hired an artist to um, design this. And then again, our participants painted it. Um, and so we did a bunch of pet patterns 
um, different portions of uh, the 200 columns all talk about different parts. It's called, um, the artwork itself is called A Lovely Day. And so each of the sections of the mural talk about a different part of Philadelphia. Um, we have um, these the triangles reflect actually, I don't think you can see them on here, but the walls of Suburban Station have triangles on them. So they reflect that, but they're also, um, are is acknowledgement of like the row homes in Philadelphia, um, keys to um, recognize Benjamin Franklin, um, different parts, different, um, uh, um, the Avenue of the Arts, because we're right under the Avenue of the Arts, the different um, parts of Avenue of the Arts that are reflected above ground. Um, and so as you walk through these columns, you can kind of walk through a day in Philadelphia. And then the current project that we're working on is um, a mural in Suburban Station as well. It's a combination of um, a um, uh, mosaic piece, um, the sun uh, the sun over here will be, I'm sorry, the moon over here will be a mosaic and um, painting. And again, our we brought in a mosaic artist to do a workshop with our folks. So um, our participants are the ones contributing to the mosaic work as well, even though the artist is the one finalizing the piece. And then they're the ones who are painting um, the full piece um, that'll go up in Suburban Station. Um, and um, Jane, unless I left anything out, uh, happy to answer questions. No, oh, I think that was great. That was that was incredible. And we're gonna come back to questions in just a minute. Mural Arts uh, is collaborating with our good friends and partners, the Color Convention Project. For those of you who have followed the Commonwealth Monument Project, you know that the Color Convention Project was one of the original convening members of our Philadelphia-based Francis Project. It was an homage through collaborative organization to the African-American poet, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, 60 organizations, about 125 individuals came together to talk about each of their interpretations of the life and impact of Francis Ellen Watkins Harper and the Color Convention Project was an anchor and original founding member of that civic dialogue. Those of you who have followed our collaboration about the impact of COVID on African-American organizations may remember that the Color Convention Project convened a statewide conversation through their partners in state in June of 2020 about the impact of COVID on African-American organizations and their visions of moving forward in the new paradigm of Black Lives Matter. When we launched our conversation about the book as a monument, we had them uh, present in this Chautauqua uh, the monumental project of writing the first major work on the color convention movement. And that is a book which we are featuring this month through the uh, Dauphin County Public Library System. And you can also order that book on Amazon. There's a little commercial for the book. Today, they're with us to talk about their partnership with the Philadelphia Mural Arts Project to create a dynamic new mural, one of a three-part mural project on the color convention. And we have Denise Berger and Brandy Locke who are no strangers to some of you and new resources for many of you to talk about that project along with Jane about the whole uh, evolution of thought, vision and the selection of artists and sight about this. Ladies, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Lemwe. We really appreciate such a glowing introduction. Um, and we are so happy to see Jane here as well. Um, you know, just seeing that presentation about mural arts affirms all of the things <laughs> that just flood our hearts and our minds when we think about uh, who we're partnering and, and just trying to take stock of how um, incredible their organization is. So uh, I'll come back to uh, some of the particulars about why uh, mural arts um, solidified into this, you know, amazing multi-year, multi-mural collaboration. 
But um, we'll go ahead and, and start our slideshow. Uh, midway, I'll pass it off to Denise. Um, but we are both uh, coordinators and liaisons for the Colored Conventions Project. It is a research project um, that is based in the Center for Black Digital Research at, uh, Pencil at uh, PSU State College. Um, and we are both also graduate students who are deeply embedded in the research uh, and the work of um, uncovering the historic movement called the Color Conventions Movement. Um, so next slide. I'm going to um, actually paint this picture for you so you can, you know, imagine this as you like um, to build off of Lenwood's wonderful story. We were um, connected to Lenwood and the Francis Harper think tank through uh, Ivan Henderson, director of uh, the Ant Museum, the African American Museum in Philadelphia. And um, we were convening at this beautiful center on Temple's University called the Blocks and Center. Um, fate would shine on us later as our center um, at, Penn, at State College is now also housed at uh, our own Bloxen <laughs> Center and Bloxen Collection. So um, that, was, that was kismet. Um, but we came to this meeting because Francis Harper is and it, and it absolutely essential figure, um, an important woman to the historic movement that we studied. Um, but we're also an organization that's deeply invested in connecting to other organizations, communities, scholars um, who want to uplift her life and legacy um, in a myriad of ways. Um, the, the beauty of that meeting was to see that um, one, she was being memorialized in a statue um, in, a, in a program defined around uh, the anniversaries of the 15th and 19th Amendment. We found that that, um, that bringing together of that moment with her legacy so compelling to, to participate in as the you know, context for this, mo for this meeting. Um, but then also we discovered several partners in the room um, that we, you know, over time have collaborated with, which includes, as pictured here, Phil Asbury, um, who is now our project manager um, with Mural Arts Philadelphia to help us advance our mural projects. Uh, he was there uh, presenting on work that he'd done with um, school-age children around a mural project that also similarly dealt with um, historic figures and archives. And so we thought that it was this really synergistic moment that, you know, would eventually turn into something so critically important to our, to our work um, and to the prospect of bringing the color conventions movement history to a larger public through arts education and um, a number of other public facing opportunities and engagements. Uh, next slide. Um, so it took us a minute to, to <laughs> really come into this partnership. Um, we've as an organization had interests and initiatives in the arts, primarily around um, a dance troupe based at the University of Delaware called Sharing Our Legacy who we worked with to um, develop both um, oratory and dance-based performances around the history of the, the color conventions movement and particularly the women within and associated with that movement. Um, they span you know, the, the country, but the women in this particular um, set of performances were from the Northeast, right? Um, but now we wanted to see if we could take up the task of looking at murals as another medium for an arts initiative, um, as well as to consider what place, what city would be the, the impetus for that, you know, for that um, new initiative. And mural arts and the city of Philadelphia emerged as the obvious and the most um, incredible place to start. Um, one of the things that uh, stands out for us for mural arts um, is that with the many organizations, you know, we're, we're very comfortable with seeing contemporary representations 
of art and culture, especially Black art and culture um, and life, but historic figures and historic um, movements and communities as represented in murals is something that um, we think is fundamentally different, it's unique, it's, it's something that could actually become <clears throat> a barrier to a community unless it's taken through a process, um, you know, and through a collective um, engagement with the creative aspects, the historic aspects, the, the aspects around uh, its location um, and its significance to the landscape, um, you know, culturally, physically of a city to bring it to a place where it actually becomes an asset to the community, to the city of Philadelphia. Um, and mural arts has gone above and beyond historically to do that um, in their projects, including ones based on historic figures like those who are represented here, which includes Richard Allen and Octavius Cato. Um, and those two, those are actually figures that we'll speak a little bit more on with respect to the larger collective of color convention delegates um, that we will be representing in our mural. Um, so next slide. Um, as we embarked on the, the process of, you know, imagining this mural, we realized we needed a collective of people who are embedded in the arts and arts institutions who um, can give critical voice to the, to the conception of this project. Um, as well as to the process of um, unpacking what we're looking for in the design, in the artists who are um, proposing uh, designs. And uh, as other projects here have mentioned, um, their, the artists' engagement, their, their um, connection to Philadelphia communities. And so we assembled this team here of beautiful people, um, we have Dr. Gabrielle Foreman, our director um, of the Color Conventions Project and the Center for Black Digital Research, uh, who is also an avid arts um, lover. We have um, obviously <laughs> Linwood Sloan, uh, who brought many of us together. Uh, Valerie Gay, who um, is deputy director of engagement at the Barnes Foundation and Vashti Du Bois, who is director of the Colored Girls Museum, um, as well as ourselves, uh, myself and Denise. Um, and we, we really leaned on this collective um, to help us pull together what would be um, a project that leverages our assets, our strengths, the most motivating parts of the, histor the historic movement, as well as the work that our project had done for that movement, um, to bring that those things into conversation with what this opportunity represented, right? What does this mural represent, not just for um, public awareness about the history, um, but an opportunity to bring people together to understand themselves, the city of Philadelphia, um, the, the significance of art to historic understandings of those same things. Um, what, how, how do we bring this project um, to a place where it encapsulates the, all of those aspects. Um, and in doing so, we had really had to start off um, from a place of examining what we knew about Philadelphia, what work we had done, um, and what was the narrative that was going to drive this first mural project. Um, so next slide. Um, so we, we dug deep there, knowing that, um, you know, with the guidance of the board, it would be really critical to share that with the mural arts uh, project manager, as well as the artists, um, in order to demonstrate the significance of the mural, demonstrate um, not just, you know, to the public what these, what, what it was that we were trying to do, um, but also to the artists, right? To show that they were essentially investing in something that had real stakes um, for the communities that they would be engaging in. And so um, we, we leaned heavily on and, and sorted heavily through all of the things that we do as a, as a research project. Um, some of the things are actually represented here in this slide. So we have 
um, both digital and historic maps that we've engaged in order to map historic sites um, across Philadelphia related to the historic movement. We've um, gotten permissions from historic societies and libraries in order to um, create profiles and some of these maps as well as digital exhibits and curriculum um, in order to present the story of what uh, the convention movement was across the nation and beyond its uh, our borders, um, as well as particularly that history in Philadelphia, which is so, so central to understanding why the historic movement actually changes the game for Black history in America and American history <laughs> in America and beyond. Um, and this is where I'm going to pass off to Denise to talk about what that narrative is, right? We, we, had, we came with all the goodies, all the research, all the, the spreadsheets and the databases and all the doodads, but the real bread and butter is this narrative. Take it away, Denise. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brandy. And thank you again for the invitation to the Color Conventions Project to this forum. Um, good to see familiar faces and a few people who I'm looking forward to getting to know, especially as we decamp to Penn State, as I'm sure some of you may already be aware. So part of the challenge of doing Black history, which as has been correctly stated, and I will emphasize, we do had already reminded us that Black history is American history. But when you have a dominant narrative that elides or marginalizes certain voices, events, and their experiences, what you end up learning, what you end up replicating, what ends up populating the public spaces are narratives that silence or narratives that are twisted because they don't actually reflect the fuller story of the events that took place. So an excellent example for, um, or a case in point would be the anti-slavery um, underground railroad abolitionist narrative, which is justifiably very popular in PA. However, when one thinks of those stories, when one thinks of that history, generally speaking, African-American voices and people do not come to mind. The truth, however, is not just reflected in William Grant Still's encyclopedic Underground Railroad compendium that he that is still considered the the urtext of this movement, being the Underground Railroad. The truth of the matter is the majority of the organizers, station captains, the uh, the inspectors, if you will, the guides were actually African American. And though we don't again think of that when we think of the Underground Railroad, that is the actual fact, or the, the, that is some of what contemporary historians have been revealing as they continue to do this work. The wonderful piece is that many of the members of the Underground Railroad were actually participants, activists, and organizers of the Colored Conventions Movement. As a matter of fact, one historian has said, Colored Convention Movement by day, Underground Railroad operators by night. Um, because of course, participating in the Underground Railroad was clandestine, you could end up arrested, you could end up killed, you could be fined. So, the challenge that we were facing, not just in our site and when we share the information about the Colored Convention Movement to most people, is most people have never heard of it. Many people have never heard of the um, men and women who were the activists and the organizers of the Colored Conventions Movement, even though they were so well known during their time period and lived very public and well-documented lives. So the, the work of the mural then is to not just introduce the Colored Conventions Movement to the residents and the visitors of the city of Philadelphia, but to make an intervention into this narrative okay. history, to add these voices, to add these stories, to add these people, their texts, their labors, their lives, where they lived, who they were, to an already existing story that actually has been revealed to be incomplete, one-sided, and I would venture to say even flat in its destructive elision of the participation of African-American citizens. So that's a tall order <laughs> to ask a muralist or, and or a mural project to accomplish. And of course, without the expert professional um, presence and support of the Mural Arts Project, I'm not sure that we would have even considered taking this on. But 
through the guidance of our board and through the skillful partnership of the Mural Arts Project we have. Would you go to the next slide, please? Introduction, this is Mr. Ernel Martinez and he is our selected artist. As you can see, two of our esteemed board members are reacting with lots of affirmation because he did such a fantastic job of capturing much of what we wanted to say, I did say that it was, if you, if you, see, you see the slide, it says in progress. Now, those of you who've done this kind of mural work before, you know exactly what that means. So this was the design brief that was produced, but it is still in the process being worked through, which has been an amazing experience. Um, I don't want to speak for her since she's here, but I am going to just a little bit for Brandy and I, because we've never participated in the creation of mural from the ground up in this way. So these seasoned sailors who have, you know, incredibly developed sea legs who are walking around as the ship is moving, we're just like, what is happening? And we're looking to these, to, to Lenwood and to Jane and to them, to the team members of Mural Arts for guidance and support because, wow, this is the work that Arnell produced. As you can see from the depiction of the 19th century, uh, images, some of whom you'll probably recognize, many of them will not be in the final rendering because he had pulled quite intelligently and quite wisely, he had pulled from um, available 19th century image sources, but not all of the people pictured here, for example, participated in the color conventions movement. So there's going to have to be some curating and that process has already started. Ornella Martinez actually has a long history with the mural arts project short history with us. Um, in doing our research about Ernell, we discovered that he was originally a student of James. That's actually how they met. And therefore he literally has come up through the ranks of the Mural Arts, um, uh, Mural Arts Philadelphia and is now our featured artist who will be working with other artists and members of the community to actually produce one of two murals that will introduce the color conventions movement make an intervention in this narrative history um, at the same time, as it is the inaugural of the first, as Brandy has said, of several murals that we'll be working on through, the, through our partnership with Mural Arts. So that's, that's just the rough design, as beautiful and striking as it is, that's just the rough design for the first wall. Can I get the next slide, please? This is again, a mock-up of the second. Um, I would take you through the different, I'm just gonna take you through a couple of pieces. So you'll see the central image is actually one of the few, it's a daguerreotype of uh, a colored convention meeting that took place in the 19th century. We do not have a lot of pictures as broad, as deep as, you know, the movement went on for, it started in 1830 and did not end until the turn of the, 20th century and the hundreds of thousands of African Americans and members of the diaspora from all over. We have proof of people attending color conventions meeting from as far as way as West Africa, Jamaica, Haiti, and Cuba traveling to the United States for these meetings. We have very, very few pictures. We have lots of reams of documentation, but very few pictures. So that image that you see there is one of our is, is, is not only one of the few images, but it's extraordinarily powerful, partially because it is showing you the perspective from the rear of the room, looking forward to the front. So what you get then is a true sense of the importance of the collective. You get an opportunity to actually see the women and the children. You can't see that because this image is too small, but it was blown up. You can see the numbers of women and children, as well as the men whose names very often in whose words are easily accessed because of the misogyny and misogynoir that is endemic in the, in the curation and the production of archives. But that is one of the things, as you can tell from Ernell's design that we are pushing against that we asked him for. So that's a statue of Mary and Chad Carey. She will be in the mural, but she will not, not, not that image. That's a whole other discussion. You'll see one of the documents from one of our color conventions meetings because of the centrality and the importance of print and the way that the organizers utilized, manipulated, and organized print medium to serve the ends of the activism. So that is a mock of the second wall, also still very much in progress, both of which have been used with permission of the artist and permission of mural arts for the purposes of showing in this, in this, in this setting. 
Okay, can excuse it, can me it, one it, moment, uh, sure. Denise. Sure. Uh, kind friends, we will go 15 minutes over the hour. We are at six o'clock. Uh, we thank our presenters. We do want you to have uh, the, the complete presentation of the color convention. So we will go to 615. I invite those of you who can to stay with us. Those of you who have other obligations, I remind you that we do post these sessions on YouTube. So we will be sending out the link of the full um, uh, presentation. It is quite a banquet that has been set by our guests. So you may wanna go back and look at that YouTube so that you can digest other information but we'll uh, stay with each other until 6.15. Thank you. I'm sorry, Denise. Not at all. Thank you, Linwood. Could you advance the slide, please? So the next steps, community engagement and curriculum development. So working with our partners, what we are going to do, which is something we have experience with working with our digital exhibits and our public facing programs is to create an engaging and interactive community engagement um, agenda and program that will include curriculum development. Now, whether this will include paint days, because again, we are taking all the direction from mural arts here because we are, we're, we're, we're following our betters where this is concerned. We know how to create curriculum, but not around murals. So we are learning how to do that. So we're creating um, a series of events and meetings, some Ideally, probably all at this point with Delta will be virtual, but we're still figuring all those details out, which will engage the community in the content of the mural, who we are as a colored conventions movement, that intervention, which I've already referenced, and what that means in this contemporary moment. So the best that I can do right now is to say, stay tuned because there's lots more to come. Can you advance the slide, please? Excellent. So Linwood has raised this as his brandy. This is what our book looks like. And this is a critically important text for anyone who has a vested interest in learning more about African-American history, but not just African-American history, but African-American activist intellectual history. The significance of that is learning and understanding that African-Americans have been organizing around issues of voting. This might sound like a tired tale, but we've actually been organized around getting African Americans the right to vote and access to the vote since the 18th, it's since the 19th century, since the 1800s. Access to the ballot box, access to fair labor, access to adequate education across the board, right? Access to be free from the violence of police brutality and the violence meted out against African American citizens by other non-African American citizens. The significance of this is it helps us to understand that when you hear historians talking about the long 19th century, what you realize is we are still in the 19th century because the issues and the challenges that we've been facing, we've been trying to actively resist or transform, we have been doing that at the very least in an organized, sustained fashion since 1830, writing about it, publishing about it, discussing it, debating it, and acting definitively on the resolutions, the ideas, the conclusions that we've made regionally, locally, and statewide. So what the Colored Conventions Movement book does is it captures just a snapshot by picking particular conventions, particular topics, and particular themes, and giving a really broad but deep introduction to the Colored Conventions Movement and to this work. If you are interested, and we know you are, please check us out, go to our website, coloredconventions.org. It is it's a very, very clear link. You can click on it, buy the book. This would be an excellent book for anyone who has even a passing interest in Black history, a real interest in American history, and a vested interest in Philadelphia's history because Philadelphia and Pennsylvania played a central role in the evolution of the Colored Conventions Movement. The first meeting was held there, organized by Bishop Richard Allen. The first five actually subsequently were held there. And what was happening in Philly, what was happening in Pennsylvania became a model for what happened nationally. And I would argue became a model for what happened within the context of the diaspora on issues of activist and political black diasporic organizing. So the import, the impacts, the, the significance 
of the color conventions movement cannot be underestimated. Most people have never heard about it. This book is an excellent introduction. So please do check it out. Next slide, please. We would like to thank you for going over time and for being willing to hang with us. Thank you again for the invitation. We are in such August company. We really, really, really are just so excited and honored to be here and to have an opportunity to share the work that we're doing with mural arts, to share the work that we're doing as an organization and to participate in this ongoing work that we have all purpose to do as activists, as people who aspire to live in the world that we would be willing to create. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, Jane, are you still with us? Yes, I am. And that was so inspiring. Um, I, I would like to ask a, a question of Jane first with the minutes that we have left. And I'll ask the same question of, of Brandy and, and Denise. Jane, how you, you've done so many incredible murals with so many different themes and subjects. How has this color conventions mural informed and expired, inspired your work? And uh, how, oh. uh, what was the arc of learning uh, for the mural arts project? Well, the arc of, I think that this is like um, the culmination of many years. So a project like this has extraordinary depth and breadth and relevance and a timeliness. Um, that was, I mean, irresistible, you know? So when we were approached, there was no way that we could say no, because the merging for us, it's always Lenwood that question how you merge program and project to have this truly sort of like um, comprehensive experience so that the art is bringing you in, but there are all these other learnings. And so that we could have a multitude of platforms, both a digital strategy, a curriculum for young people, you know, maybe QR codes. So people who are coming to the wall can sort of find out about it on their phone, but also just visually appreciate it. Like it's beautiful and captivating, right? So that to me was like, oh my God. And so we're learning as we're going, cause it's like on different levels. And you know, you always learn from, I mean, and Brandy and Denise know this from the, uh, the initial wall hunts, like where will it be? Where will it live? People's perceptions, people's thoughts, people who embraces it, who goes like that, who's sort of curious, like, you know, you can see all the reasons why this is so important. And so every step of the way you're like, ah, this is like a non-negotiable for us, completely a hundred percent. Excellent. And Brandy and Denise, I would like to ask you if you're on, I unmute Denise. Uh, now that you have immersed yourself in the the, the vocabulary, the DNA, the uh, the uh, iconography of the mural arts project, how do you look at your landscape and your environment different? Uh, how have you been informed by the immersion and collaboration with the mural arts folks? I'm going to let Brandy start because Brandy is like the real artist person and I'm going to bring up the rear as the as the for real for real amateur on the block. So I'm going to let the I'm, I'm definitely inviting Brandy to respond first and then I'll, I'll follow up. <laughs> Thanks Denise. Um, Denise says that because like others here like Ruby mentioned um, you know family is deeply rooted in an appreciation for art and its place um, you know, in our lives, in our hearts, and in society. And um, I think one of the biggest transformations that mural arts has ushered in for me personally, as well as for um, our project overall, is around scale. Um, we're, we're a project that is scrappy, and we grow by you know, starting off with a small core team and then reaching out, reaching out, reaching out, um, and I think in the ways that we have envisioned arts partnerships and arts initiatives before, it's been, you know, quite small, um, you know, people doing beautiful work, ambitious for their own selves. Um, but really, um, this is a whole new level, a whole new scale um, that actually amplifies something that we know is critically important of the color conventions movements history that's really hard to, to 
explain in words or even in a digital project, which is that this movement that lasted 70 years that changes the game about everything we know about black historical organizing um, and political organizing began here in this very city's landscape. Um, and you know, we, we want people to see this mural just like they see other mural arts murals and say, gosh, this is here. This history is right here, right? This, this convention that is being presented on this wall is, is something that happened, you know, just blocks away. Like literally we have a, an exhibit that demonstrates that one of the conventions was held blocks away from the location of the Liberty Bell right now, which is blocks away from the African-American you know, Museum of Philadelphia. We, we wanna be part of tours. We wanna be part of people's experiences of their um, lived environment, their neighborhoods in a way that elevates this history and this movement um, to something that's both everyday, but also massively important and historic. And mural arts is the conduit to us doing that through the arts and with the public in a way that um, our book is, you know, gesturing to do with, with scholars and other projects are doing in various types of classrooms. But now we have a whole new, you know, a whole new horizon we're aiming towards. So thank you. We're so thank grateful. You. And Denise, I'm going to ask you the same question. I'm reaching for the transformative nature of public art. And as you walk the block, drive the city, come up out of the subway, look across the landscape through the window of a building, how has mural art help you to see the city different and to see the dialogue that public art creates? Uh, in a way that informs Absolutely. your own work and your Absolutely. own life. Absolutely. I, I, I appreciate, of course, you would ask a question that would be so substantive. I really appreciate that question for several reasons. So one, um, I am heavily involved in curriculum development for the Color Conventions Project. So I'm very accustomed to, at this point anyway, taking our archival material, which is very much flat, one-dimensional, you know, literally coming out of an archive, very often pulled from a website, so it's a digital medium, and trying to think of ways to bring it to contemporary life, compelling or interesting to a 12-year-old or to a 13-year-old or a 16-year-old. So I'm even it's happening in the classroom, happening with a student on a computer or having a student working with her classmates. The scale, as Brandy said, but more so than the scale, it now becomes four dimensional because now it's existing not only in a kind of private contemporary space, but a public legacy type space. And to be able to bridge the connection between the classroom and a corner or a city block, to be able to, you know, I remember when you're we having some of our first meetings that Jane clearly remembers, and I was like, we should have QR codes. And Jane was like, yes. And so you can actually then take your phone if you're a student and make the connection between what you're learning in your classroom, scan your QR code that you see on a mural, and all of a sudden, every aspect of private and public space that you occupy on a regular basis is now connected. And you're actually able to experience and learn about African-American history, particularly if you're an African-American student, in a way that locates you in multiple dimensions, times, and spaces at the same time. The scope, the promise of what public art can, can generate, can create, can sustain, is almost limitless when you start thinking about it from the position of the creator. And by that, I mean, I'm not painting anything. I'm a part of the process to bring this particular initiative to life. I had had opinions about Confederate monuments and how problematic they were. And I did absolutely think that they should be critiqued and analyzed and communities should determine what should happen to them. I have a deeper understanding and appreciation of the power of art in public spaces as a consequence of working with this working with this initiative with mural arts. So how has it changed for me? It has changed the way I'm able to think 
about not just curriculum work, but my end goal, my personal goal, which would be that an, just an everyday student would be able to have a transformed experience of themselves in history, in the contemporary moment, as a consequence of being able to see and interact with this kind of public art. Thank you so much. You all have been so gracious. Uh, I've negotiated 15 additional min minutes and I'm going to hold to that. So you'll want to come back next time. Uh, we are going to, before we close the recording, take a few more minutes. So those of you who have uh, uh, witnessed this dialogue will have some time to put additional questions in the chat. As you know, we both make a recording uh, on YouTube and we also uh, communicate and promote the chat on the Monument Projects website so that we can uh, traffic your questions to our presenters tonight and also post your questions as a dialogue and across current. Um, thank you all so much for being with us in this eighth program of Live and Learn. You know, all our grandmothers said that, well, child, live and learn. So I hope <laughs> that our lives have been enriched, you know, and that we've learned something tonight. <laughs> so to meet again, I'll see you on the road. Take good care of yourself and stay hydrated. <laughs> Thank you. Good night.